If you're a digital photographer about to dip your toes into the world of film, I'm excited for you. You're gonna have a lot of fun with it. There's a bunch of decisions to make, like what sort of film you're gonna use, the projects that you're gonna work on, are you gonna develop it at home or send it out, and of course, which type of vintage camera to use. In this video, we'll explore four different ways to go about getting your first film camera. I'll go over the pros and cons of each and hopefully it'll make your decisions easier. I'm gonna be talking about groups of cameras rather than specific makes and models because I think once you pick the direction to go in, picking a specific make and model will be easier. In a lot of cases, the film stock will affect your image more than a specific camera will anyway. We'll cover options that are budget friendly, ones that might fit with your digital equipment, and we'll look at cameras that do things that are pretty much impossible in the digital world. But to begin with, we'll look at the easiest and lowest cost point of entry, the point and shoot. Cheap and cheerful point and shoots give you simple operation at a price point low enough that you probably won't get buyer's remorse. You'll find them in charity shops, thrift stores, eBay, or even in a relative's closet. There's an interesting definition of point and shoot on Wikipedia, because it seems that the Americans and the Brits use the term point and shoot in different ways. In the UK, it means an automatic camera, regardless of size. And in the US, it means a compact camera, regardless of its capabilities. Let me know how you'd define the term point and shoot in the comments below. When I was building out my vintage camera collection, I avoided point and shoots for years. I thought they were all automatic with limited focusing options and low quality optics. And it turns out that's not always the case. I changed my mind about them one summer in England where I found this Olympus Super Zoom for two pounds. I wanted to hate this camera. It's ugly, it feels cheap, and it makes the weirdest noises you've ever heard. Curiosity made me put a roll of film in it and I was upset to be pleasantly surprised by how well the images came out. Image quality isn't the best, but a lot of the things that I thought would be cons turned out to be pros. It's simple to operate, lightweight, so I'm happy carrying it around all day, and the on-camera flash. I'd been avoiding on-camera flash for so long and it turned out to be amazing fun. You get a certain look from that direct light and sometimes it's the bold effect that you need. Other point and shoots would include disposable cameras and the classic Kodak box brownie. The most common digital point and shoot is probably in your hands right now. If you're set in your ways like me, a film point and shoot will help you loosen up and have some fun with photography. And if it ends up being not what you were looking for, then you're not much out of pocket. The second option for your first film camera might sound like a good idea at first, but I'm not sure if it is in the long run. And that's sticking with your digital camera's lens mount. If you've got a digital camera from a manufacturer with some history, you might be able to use a newer lens on an older film camera body. And that's what I've got here. I've got an EF lens that I use with my 5D Mark IV, and I've bolted it onto a Canon EOS 5. And there are ways to do that with other camera brands too. The benefit is you only need to get a camera body and not the lenses to go with it, like you would if you were to go for a discontinued lens mount. It keeps costs down even though you have a very capable camera body, but all we've really done is change the digital sensor for a film one. Especially with these camera bodies from the 80s, the experience of shooting with it isn't all that different. And because it's so similar to a modern camera, you might forget and take shots as quickly as you would with a digital camera. Before you know it, the film's rewinding and you need to put another roll in. This type of camera is a mix between feeling like a digital body, but getting the results of film. And if it's the tone and the grain of film that you're after specifically, then this might be the type of camera you're after. This makes me realize that analog photography isn't just about shooting film. Sometimes what you're after is a simpler experience, perhaps using a mechanical camera that routes you deeper into the history of photography. That's why you might want to consider one of these seemingly thousands of different types of mechanical SLRs that are out there. They come with all the lenses and apertures that you're familiar with and you know where the shutter button's going to be. Some cameras get special attention because of their role in historic events or because they help shape the way photographs are taken. 
Classic cameras let you hold a piece of history, but it's not going to be at a point and shoot price. Like a rangefinders were the first 35mm cameras and used to capture the decisive moment. Speed graphics were a staple of the early 20th century press and Hasselblad took the first pictures from the moon. With more expensive cameras, I'd recommend going to a reputable dealer with good warranties and return policies in case anything doesn't work. Getting a classic camera might be overkill, especially if you don't stick with film for an extended amount of time. On the other hand, if you know exactly what you want and why, it might be the only film camera you ever need. And that brings us to the fourth category of cameras for the first time film photographer. It's not the cheapest way in, but it might be the most exciting, especially if you're into a specific niche of photography. And that's because there's a number of film cameras that digital never really replaced. Unlike the jack of all trades cameras we have today, all of these cameras had a specific style of photography in mind. I got into film initially because I wanted to try medium format photography for my portraits. To get into a digital system would have cost tens of thousands of dollars, but for closer to $1,200, I could get a beat up Hasselblad 500 and an old lens. And I can shoot image sizes that were way larger than any commercially available digital sensor. Any Hasselblad, Mamiya or Bronica will transport you back to the world of their celebrity studio photographer. They were out of reach of most people back then, but I think they're quite attainable to a lot of people right now. Other vintage cameras remind us that medium format isn't even that large in the grand scheme of things. It gets bigger from there. That's why they called it medium format. With digital sensors, the largest practical digital sensors are six by four and a half centimeters. So if you want to experiment with image sizes larger than that, film's the only way to go. For less than $50, you can shoot six by nine centimeter frames on a box brownie or there are even reasonably priced large format cameras like the Intrepid, where you can shoot image sizes that are measured in inches rather than centimeters. With large format cameras, the lenses tilt and shift so you can move the plane of focus, really handy for those of you that are taking landscapes or still lifes. And there are plenty of other film cameras that can do things that digital cameras cannot. Stereo cameras to make 3D images. Square format cameras with sneaky side-on viewfinders like the Robot. 35mm is the size of a deck of cards like the Rolly 35. It's so small, it makes a fantastic discreet street photography tool. There are also panoramic devices like the Wide Lux, compact half-frame cameras like the Olympus Pen, and waterproof cameras like the Nikonus. It's amazing how many novel vintage cameras were around at one time or another. So if you've got a particular project in mind, you can pick the right camera for the job. The world of film cameras is huge and overwhelming, but knowing what you want to get out of it will help you narrow your choices, especially if you know what your genre or project's going to be. We've covered cameras from cheap to convenient to exotic. Let me know in the comments below what your first film camera was or how you're deciding what your first film camera will be.